Well, today I want to talk about an emotion that goes all the way back to the beginning of mankind. Uh, it's, it's an emotion that mankind experienced, that mankind continues to experience. It's an emotion that the Son of God and Jesus Christ experienced in this life. Shame. Boatloads of shame. Day after day, more of the same. Blame. Please lift it off. Please take it off. Please make it stop. How many of you know that song? Anybody? Okay, we got a few. We got a few. Got a, I knew uh, David uh, was a David Doolin was an Avett Brothers fan. It's uh, the one of the songs by the Avett Brothers. They're kind of a, a folk music group. They've got a little bit of a bluegrass sound. Uh, my my daughter, our oldest daughter, Stacy, introduced that group to me when she was attending uh, college in Alabama. It, 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 they, they are known for singing about the human plight, you know, the things with which we struggle as humans, the, the emotions, the behavior, the missteps, and, and dealing with that and the impact that it has on us uh, individually and on our relationships, mistakes, falling short, all of these kinds of things. Are you presently, or have you ever been smothered by shame? Have you ever experienced shame and, and, and felt it smother you, trapped by it, unable to lift it off? Is experiencing the feeling of utter shame, is that a good thing or a bad thing? You know, we think about the media today, we've got both sides that, uh, of the, you know, the ultra, ultra right, the ultra, ultra left, leftist kind of thing. We've got liberal and conservative, all these, these uh, different media outlets and what they're saying. They, they seek, so much uh, of it is, is a seeking to bring shame upon the other, to, to call them out and to nail them for what that is and, and shame the other, to discredit others by any means possible. Seeking to nail someone by a single statement. If I can just uh, get them on this single statement, a sound bite that I can use over and over and over again uh, to discredit this person for the rest of that person's life. How would you like to be characterized or, or labeled for a single statement that you've made? One of mine that I cannot get out of my head is uh, Howard Dean, the, the one who was running for, for president a few years back, and he had won a primary and had gotten so excited around this rally. And uh, he was later the Dem the, one of the, the, the chairman of the Democratic National Committee. But many of you that follow politics would remember this. He got excited, and we're going to go here, and then we're going to go on to this, and we're going to go on to this. And he went, ah, he was trying to, he was so excited, he yelled. And it was one of the weirdest sounding <laughs> yells that I, that sounded somewhat weird, didn't it? What I just did, but it was very, very strange sounding. And, and the, 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 the critics on the other side played that, 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 weird sound that he made over and over and over again. To this day, I cannot think of, of Howard Dean without thinking of that moaning, yelling, kind of happy, weird, bizarre thing. That, that, that character, he's characterized by that single sound bite. Have you ever, ever stated anything or done anything that you regretted later? I haven't. Uh, again, you guys may have, but I cannot think of a time that I ever did that, let alone in a, in a, in a public setting, in a message. Uh, but uh, what would it be like to be branded by that, to be branded by that, to be branded by a soundbite? Uh, those of us that stay up on, on politics and the news uh, know that soundbite from this week, the, the infamous soundbite by President Donald Trump. USA Today, July 19, 2008. 18. President Donald Trump sought to walk back his remarks with Russian President Vladimir Putin on Tuesday by correcting a single word uttered during the 46-minute joint appearance in Helsinki. When Trump said he couldn't see any reason why Russia would have been involved in the U.S. presidential election, what he meant to say was, wouldn't. I, I said the word would, Instead of wouldn't, Trump explained, speaking at the White House more than 24 hours after his news conference with Putin began, uh, after that began drawing fire from allies and critics alike. The sentence should have been, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't be Russia. 
I, I think that probably clarifies uh, things pretty good by itself, Trump said. Of course, critics, as the article brings out, and as most of you are aware, critics were quick to suggest that the context around the president's comments or his quote indicates that he said what he meant the first time. What, what did he mean when he said that? When he walked it back, what did he mean? Was, was he being truthful that he really did make a misstep? Uh, yes, I was kidding. I have made missteps. And my wife has told me that I said that. I, I did not say that. You said it. And then I, I did say it. And I could not believe that I said that. I'm, it does happen. But, uh, but was it, a, was it uh, something that he changed his mind based on you know, the pressure that he got, this or that? Uh, only God knows. Uh, and maybe those closest to him that had that conversation. But that is between him and his maker. Another situation that uh, some of you may remember during President Obama's uh, tenure as president, uh, during a speech at a DNC fundraiser, the president at the time, President Obama, said, we should be reforming our criminal justice system in such a way that we are not incarcerating nonviolent offenders offenders in ways that render them incapable of getting a job after they leave office. <laughs> what he meant to say was uh, getting a job after they leave prison. But, uh, you know, what, what did the critics say? Well, yeah, yeah, he, he knows all the guys on his sides are crooks. They're this and that and this and that. And it just came out because that's the way it really is. But imagine being, being nailed by a single, single soundbite. Speaking of, speaking of prison, uh, Merle Haggard uh, sang a song, I think I quoted it before on a different, uh, different topic uh, a few years back, but he, quoted, he sang a song back in the 70s that, that my dad had on, on his LP, on his 33 and a third LP, that I would listen to, but it was called Branded Man. Uh, when they let me out of prison, I held my head up high, determined I would rise above the shame. But no matter where I'm living, the black mark follows me. I'm branded with a number on my name, branded by a single act. And any of us that have, have dealt with folks or, or know of folks that have a felony beside their name uh, know what that's like. They are branded. There are some things that you are, are never going to be able to do in this lifetime because of that brand, because of that mark. Uh, folks that are, are in uh, felony situations uh, try, try to get, a, try to get a, an apartment. And the challenge with just getting an apartment if you, if you uh, have had a felony. There are certain doors that are closed. The shame, uh, trying to rise above the shame as, as he gets out of prison. Specifically, uh, it's very frustrating when an act or something that we say is not, is not a characterization of who we are. Uh, it's a misstep. We, 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 we messed up, but it's, it doesn't speak to who we are and, and to be shamed by that. Uh, this is all by way of introduction, but let's look at two examples. 1 Samuel 25. Let's go to 1 Samuel 25 to begin today. We have a, an individual uh, who is discussed here in David's travels as Saul is after him, and he's got his band of men that, that are with him. And they looked after, as you know this story, they looked after, while they were in their travels, they looked after the, the thousands, uh, thousand sheep and thousand goats of Nabal and, and cared for them and protected them, as the servants later mentioned, in situations where it could have gone uh, very poorly for all of, all of his holdings and, and for those who were caring for the sheep and goats. Uh, this individual who owned all of that was a very wealthy man. Uh, in 1 Samuel 25, verse, verse 3, the name of the man was Nabal, me, Hebrew meaning dolt. We don't use that term much, but uh, dolt, a, a dull, stupid person, a clod, uh, this, this individual. He had a wife named Abigail. She was a woman of good understanding and beautiful appearance, but the man was harsh and evil in his doings. This individual was characterized by harshness and evil. That, that's how he was viewed because that's how he was. Uh, he, to us, has come to be known by a, by a single soundbite. We know the story. Uh, David and his men looked after them uh, and while they were uh, 
fleeing from Saul and, and, and trying to stay away from that. David was waiting for his time. He wasn't going to raise up his hand against the Lord's anointed. And, and in the process, he, he did things for people, and he looked after uh, various people, and he did this for them and never took advantage of them in any way. Well, they were in a situation with the men where they needed uh, sustenance, and, and they uh, humbly re requested that. They sent a servant. David sent a servant to ask. Let's break into the, the story here. So, so he asked them to do that. So verse 9, so when David's young men uh, came, they spoke to Nabal. And David, uh, to Nabal, according to all these words in the name of David, and they waited. Here is the soundbite for Nabal. Nabal answered and said to David's servants and said, Who is David and who's the son of Jesse? There are many servants nowadays who break away each from his master. Speaking of, of, of uh, David and Saul, uh, again, casting a wrong light on what had happened. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I've killed for my shears and give it to men whom I do not know where they're from? David's young men turned on their heels, went back and told David, and David said, I'm going to take this guy out. I'm going to take out all of the men and all the males who serve him. There, there won't be a single one remaining. That is the soundbite for which we remember Nabal. Now, the thing is, Part of the reason why we remember that is, is for, for him to make these shameful statements uh, in a lack of appreciation uh, for David's services and then also to, to say it in the, in the caustic way that he did. It was a characterization of who he was. So therefore, that soundbite sticks. And that's how we remember Nabal. Look at, uh, as the story goes, we know about Abigail's intervention. I, I find this fascinating, and I want to draw some less, uh, a lesson from this a little bit later in the message, but let's speak to the shame, uh, the shameful conduct of, of Nabal in terms of, of Abigail even, even stating it. Let's look at verse uh, verse. 23. We just see David's comment in verse 22 of what he's going to do. Abigail saw David, verse 23, she dismounted quickly from the donkey, fell on her face before David and bowed down to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, on me, my Lord, on me, let this iniquity be. Wait, wait why would she say that? Why would she, is, is that some kind of, a, of an angle that she's taking to appeal to David? Or, or does she really believe that? Does she really believe that she can say, let this act of my husband be on me? I don't believe she's lying. I don't believe she's conniving. I think she really took that that way. Could, could you and I do that? Could you and I do that? I wanna, we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later in the message. But uh, in terms of the shame, she she experienced the shameful behavior of her husband and, and accepted that and allowed that to be placed on her. A very fascinating example that I think bears discussion later in the message. Okay, so she says that, and, and then she, uh, she says, and please let your maidservant speak in your ears and hear the words of your maidservant. Verse 25, please let not my Lord regard this scoundrel Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name and folly is with him. But I, your maidservant, did not see the young men of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives, speaking to David, as the eternal lives, uh, and as your soul, David, lives, since the eternal has held you back from coming to blood, bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then, let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as Nabal. And now this, this present, which your maidservant has brought to my Lord, the food and all the things that she uh, hastened to bring, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please, he, she says it again, please forgive the trespass of your maidservant. For the eternal will certainly make for my Lord, speaking of David, an enduring house, because my Lord, David, fights the battles of the Lord, and evil is not found in you throughout your days. Interesting that uh, she acknowledges the shameful conduct of her husband, calls it for what it is. Of course, we know what later happens to Nabal and, and what happens to Abigail, and, and also accepts some of that. Nabal is rightly remembered and characterized by 
that shameful soundbite. Let's look at another example, Numbers, Numbers 20. We haven't gotten into the, the meat of what we want to discuss, but I think it's critical that we, that we note this. Because, brethren, we know that what, what Christ said, that we're, we're held accountable to God for every idle word uh, that, we, that we make. And, and may we, and may I, uh, in every way, strive to be very, very careful about what I say and, and how I say it, as, as all of us should. We recognize that, but at the same time, uh, we, are, we are flesh and blood, and we do make missteps. And it's critical that God sees those in the context of, of the characterization of the, of the individual. Is it out of the abundance of the, the heart, the mouth speaks? If it is a characterization of us, that will be what flows out of our mouths. Uh, there are some thoughtless statements that we make uh, from time to time, and we are accountable to God for them. But in terms of, of how God remembers us and how God characterizes us, there, there are two different things, and we see that here in Numbers 20, verse 7. Numbers 20, verse 7, the whole story of the rock and, and water coming out uh, of it for Israel. We know that story, but let's look at it with uh, focus on this point. So, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, okay, you take the rod, you and your brother Aaron, you gather the children, the congregation together, speak to the rock. In some places he was instructed to strike the rock, but in this case, speak to the rock before their eyes and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. In verse 10, Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock and he said to them, he didn't speak to the rock. He said to them, Hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? He lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with his rod. God honored that. Water came out abundantly, and the congregation and their animals drank. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, Because you did not believe me to hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Okay, I, so we want to make a delineation here. Moses' sin resulted in consequences, correct? And did God relent on that? Moses appealed to him several times. God said, stop it. Stop asking. You are not going into the land of Canaan. His sin had consequences. But God did not, God did not take that soundbite and characterize Moses by that single statement. Moses, in Scripture, is known as the meek, one of the meekest men ever. Uh, Moses was a man of God. Moses continued to follow God up until his death. So there, uh, we, he made an error in judgment, but it was not who he was. And with respect to shame, did, did Moses then carry the shame of that the rest of his life? I don't believe he did. I don't believe he carried that shame. I believe he recognized the sin, appealed to God over and over. He still dealt with the consequences of this, that sin. But, but how does God view Moses? He looks at Moses as a person who's going to be there at the return of Christ as a spirit being. Very, very, very different outcomes, but it, it deals with the, the, the characterization, and God is the perfect judge. So let's talk about shame today. Let's talk about shame. I, as I do that... I want to talk a little bit, I don't do this often, but I just want to share with you how I see my role as, as pastor. I am a sheep just like you are sheep. I, I have a responsibility before God to shepherd you under the true pasture, pasture pastor, uh, and, and hopefully give you good, good ground to, to feed. Uh, but I am a sheep too. And, and, and as I think, I try to, you know, we, we have different thoughts about our roles as, as pastor, but I, I see with me, my, my chief desire and my ch chief goal as, a, as your pastor is to help you see the importance of following the true shepherd. My, my goal is, is to help facilitate or help inspire each of, of us here to, to follow the shepherd to not allow anything to separate us from the shepherd. 
the true shepherd and to follow that shepherd till we finish the race. I mean, that, that's what it's all about. That's what we're all trying to do is follow that shepherd all the way. And in that process, we have various roles within the church of God. We have various roles to serve and, and help and, and build up the church and, and preach the gospel and all of these things. But when it comes down to it, uh, of what I'm going to be held accountable to God uh, for doing over, over uh, an aspect of the household which God gives me responsibility to, to care for, he holds me accountable for that. Uh, the degree to which I strive to help uh, those with, with whom we, we, we serve to, to follow that true shepherd and to follow that true shepherd fully. Uh, so shame is, is a, a, a thing that I've seen over the years with God's people that can really, really mess them up. Uh, so I, I want to talk about shame today and and ask us several things. One, does God expect us to continue to live with shame? Shame is an emotion. Shame is an emotion that goes way back. Uh, are we to have that A on the dress, as, as in the scarlet letter? Is that supposed, are we supposed to carry that uh, all of our lives? What is the purpose of shame? What, what, what role does shame play in a Christian's life? Is it a good or a bad thing? Is it good or bad? Can shame become toxic and threaten to destroy us spiritually? How are we to manage and deal with shame that besets us from time to time? I, I, just, I just thought this week of, uh, well, this, uh, uh, of the week during camp, I had a couple of situations where I, I experienced shame. I, uh, there was one situation in a, in a public setting where something was said, I didn't catch it, and I, and I had a chance to address it in a way that would have been positive and dealt with. But here I was in the role of, of, of in a sense, shepherding the camp. And I, and I didn't address something that should have been addressed uh, for the sake of everybody. And left unsaid, uh, it left question, at least in my mind as I considered that, about not addressing that as I should have. That, that, was, an, that was a responsibility that I had that I didn't catch and handle at the time. I felt shame over that. I felt a shame over a, a comment that I made in a public set situation kidding around, which again, like you say, that's the first time I've ever kidded around in my life. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, was, it was in, in that setting. But, but I, I went a little too far and said something I shouldn't have said, and, and I felt shame over that. Uh, we, we all have that time to time where we're regretting saying something or, or not stepping in and doing something when we should. Shame is produced internally by the conscience. You know, Mr. Johnson covered that recently in a, in a uh, young adult's Friday Night Live uh, message about, about conscience. Uh, in talking, he talked about the subject of conscience. Shame is, is, is produced internally by the conscience. It's an emotion that comes about when the conscience is, is pricked, when the, when the conscience is... is uh, is, is pushed upon. Uh, but it's not always by an internal force, is it? Let's talk about the internal force. Uh, we, are, we are convicted by our conscience of what we have done, and we thought about it, I said this, or I did this, or I didn't say this when I should have, and I, and I didn't act here when I should have. We're convicted by that internally, and we experience shame due to our guilt over a situation. That, that's how that, that works. Guilt over the inappropriate act or thought. But sometimes it can be external. Sometimes it can be in a situation where something is made known to us by another person and we didn't even realize we had done it or we said it and we didn't think about it at the time, but then we say it and the, another person, external force, comes and says, you said this. Oh, it, and it, it comes across that way. Oh, yeah, and I wasn't thinking. Oh. And then internally, the conscience, again, is pricked, and we're, when we're thinking about that and we realize, oh, we have guilt over that and we feel shame. Uh, they enlighten us, we're convicted by our conscience, we feel shame, sometimes in addition, humiliation. Uh, now, a third area, sometimes, is, is an external situation where we, we realize something that we did was wrong, but we continue to do it anyway. Nobody really saw it. I know it was wrong, but I'm doing this, and I'm not. It's like a slight conviction of the conscience, but not major, and we continue to do it, 
and then somebody calls us on it, and then it's known. It becomes known that we have done that. And then we feel the shame of the, the embarrassment of the situation, an embarrassment or a shame that we did not feel, even though, though we knew it was wrong, until it was brought to our attention. Now, of the three, that's the dangerous one. Uh, all three of those can result in our turning and repenting and walking towards God. But that third one, if any of us get in that situation, I'll admit I've been alive for a few years and I, I, have, I have had that uh, sometimes in my life. That third one is getting on dangerous ground. When, when we know what we're doing is wrong, we continue to do it until we get nailed for it. Uh, that, that's, that's dangerous because we're not working with our internal conscience to turn and go the right direction. Uh, and yet we wait till we experience humiliation and shame from an outside source. Uh, it's important to realize the four aspects of shame, which we're going to cover in the time remaining. Uh, because, again, shame plays a part in the human emotion of life. Shame even played a part in Jesus Christ's life. So I, I want to talk about it today and, and ask us to think about these concepts in the time remaining. Let's think about a subject, I won't turn there as we had to memorize this as kids, uh, but it's, it's Mark 8.38, uh, Mark 8.38, I think most of you are, are, would be aware of this as I quote this, but uh, it's the whole thing of whoever, uh, whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my words, this is Jesus Christ, whosoever will be ashamed of me and my words in this evil and adulterous generation, shows, so shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes before the glory of God with his angels. Uh, the, the first point is we can, we can possess misplaced shame. We can possess misplaced shame uh, to where we, we have shame for what is right and for what is godly. We are ashamed of, of what we believe to the point that we're not ready to stand up for our beliefs. We're not ready to stand up for our beliefs and our action, actions in the presence of others. We're ashamed of that. And, and not on guard for that to stand for it. That is misplaced shame. And Christ says, you go down that path, I'm going to be ashamed of you uh, when, 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 I, when I return. So we do not want that. And I, I think most of us at one time or another have, have, have recognized when we didn't quite do that. And we humbly repent, we turn to God, and we ask God to cleanse us of that and help us to be valiant warriors uh, spiritually standing up for, for our, our Lord and Master Jesus Christ and, and for God and his way of life. Uh, that's one aspect of misplaced shame. Misplaced shame is, is a factor that, that uh, can, can hurt us spiritually. Uh, the, the other aspect, and we'll talk about several of these, is, is to have, have it placed on us wrongly to where we have a distorted sense of shame. Uh, sometimes that's the case. You know, say, for instance, and we won't get into details, we have children here, but there are certain types of abuse that, that happen to children to where the children grow up feeling a sense of shame, yet they had nothing to do with it. That, that was done uh, without their consent. That was done to them, and yet they, they, they feel that burden of shame, and yet it is, again, it, it's not, it's not their, their doing. Uh, that, that's a, a misplaced shame, and, and, and many of these kinds of things get into the area of professional counseling to help a person work through that, as well as uh, counseling through God's Word. But there are some other uh, psychology uh, concepts that I, I think are just critical to cover, because I've talked with brethren over the years and ministry, the ministry has uh, with folks that, that struggle with this, so it's, it brings it's worthy of, of discussion in this sermon. So you get a, uh, you'll get a few psychological terms here, but I want to quote from an article uh, titled uh, Overcoming the Paralysis of Toxic Shame, uh, an essential step for cultivating healthy anger. Uh, the author, uh, Bernard Golden, uh, goes into, uh, speaks more to the, the situation of how to cultivate a healthy anger towards certain things. I'm not going to get into that, but I do want to talk a little bit about what he, what he, what he stated in his uh, April 22nd, 2017 article uh, regarding shame itself. Shame, like guilt and embarrassment, 
involves negatively judging ourselves when we believed we failed to live up to either our own standards or the standards of others' behavior. That, that in a sense, is shame. I, I haven't lived up. I recognize I haven't lived up. Others see that. I see my own life. I haven't lived up. I, I feel shame. Recall a time when you experienced shame, whether it was a reaction to judgment by others or, or, you, on your, or your own. You most likely experienced intense discomfort, feelings of inadequacy and unworthiness and the desire to hide, as did Adam and Eve. And you most likely felt anger toward others uh, or with yourself, anger at the self for how did I do that? Shame often is accompanied by anger. I, I, he said, I agree uh, with Dr. Brene Brown, who describes healthy shame as being guilt. Simply the, the, the understanding of guilt and the shame that accompanies that. Guilt can be healthy in moving us toward positive thinking and behavior. It is specific in its focus. Shame when toxic, shame when toxic, and, I, and I've talked with brethren over the years that, that have moved into this area of, of toxic shame. It's a paralyzing global assessment of oneself as a person. When severe, it can form the lens through which all self evaluation is, is, is viewed. They, they have a toxic view of themselves, themselves, a toxic shame over themselves to where it, 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 it forms the lens, it messes with the lens, it distorts the lens of, of how we see ourselves. As such, some words used to express the emotion of shame include feeling insecure, worthless, stupid, foolish, silly, inadequate, or simply less than. Everyone experiences shame at some time, but not everyone is ruled by toxic or overwhelming shame. Some researchers suggest that shame comes about from repeatedly being told not that we did something bad, but that we are something bad. There's an example in the article about uh, you know, a, a situation where the kid struggles with, with uh, he's sitting at the table and he str struggles with being uh, uh, careful and, and knocks over the milk, knocks over the milk. You know, you uh, are bad. You are a bad person. You are clumsy. You are this versus, well, uh, you weren't being careful and this, this happened. Let's, let's move the cup over here and let's try to be more careful to keep that from happening again. One, one deals with the act and the other deals with the person, uh, attacking the person. And, and that, that's a, a key parental technique is to, when you attack the person, it, it puts on that person a feeling of shame uh, versus the shame that should come from, uh, from, not, from, from a wrong act. The, the, the shame focuses on that person that I am shameful. I am in my, in my own nature. I am shameful. I am, I am unworthy. I am, I'm, you know, all these, these inadequate. I am everything that I am not supposed to be uh, versus the other. So, uh, he says, uh, consequently, it can close us off from accepting any form of positive regard from others or ourselves. Paralyzing shame can lead us to feel undeserving of such regard. It can undermine being fully present with others and with ourselves. Now, that's a little psychology term, but being fully present, it means like when we're in, even in a conversation with others, we are so... Uh, captivated by our own shameful view of ourselves that we can't even view what's happening in, a, in, a, in an interaction with another person that is healthy. We, we see it through this lens that is not real because it's covered by our shame of who we think we are. Uh, this makes perfect sense, he says, as it takes a lot of energy to protect us against our vulnerability to feel that shame. More, most Im importantly, difficulty with shame leaves us prone to anger, anger that results when natural desires for love, connection, validation are inhibited by the impenetrable barrier of shame. Developed heightened vulnerability to experience shame most often occurs in our early years. It can form the foundation for our feeling unlovable, undeserving, and for a harshly self-critical inner dialogue. And while single events can yield shame, it is often the result of more pervasive experiences. You know, he talks about the situation where the kid, the six-year-old boy, wets the bed at night. He's asleep. He doesn't have any knowledge of it. And, he, and the dad, he just remembered the look 
of shame that his dad had as he looked at his son, as he brought all the siblings up around the bed to shame the son over what he had done. And that, that, that shame overwhelmed that, that child to, to the point to where the other ways that shame, it began, it began to be the bubble in which he lived, the, the lens with which he viewed everybody with whom he interacted, the, the shame that he felt. Uh, so our one reaction labels the specific behavior, the other label uh, labels the child as a whole. That is a situation, again, under our first point, where we get to this thing of wrongly placed shame, uh, wrongly placed shame. It can really impact uh, the individual. And again, I, with that point, there, there, there are some psychology issues there. There are, there are some areas of, of professional psychology that, that will help an individual work through some of those kinds of things. And, I, and again, if you're in that situation, I, I would encourage you to seek counsel with the ministry, but also to seek professional counseling to work through that because it involves a rewiring of thinking uh, because of what uh, the person's experienced. Uh, the second area, let's go to Romans 1. The second area I want to cover today uh, gets, gets more into the, the spiritual component of, of shame, even though uh, the first one can be very spiritual in nature as well. Romans 1, we'll start in verse 26 as we look at the, the outgrowth of, of not acknowledging God as, as creator and in all that God has, has done, and we see this in today's society. I mean, this is, this is talked a lot about, uh, about in God's church, and, and, and I think it should be, because we need to be able to stand for what is right and what is wrong. Also, we need to be able to counsel folks who, uh, who are recognizing what is right and what is wrong and need help in these areas. Uh, we, we, we do both. But... Uh, Romans 1 verse 26 makes this statement because of, 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 of doing what they did, exchanging the truth of God for the lie. For this reason, God gave them up to vile passions, for even their women exchanged in the natural use for what is against nature, you know, uh, women with women, as he's saying here. Verse 27, likewise, also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman. God designed the husband and wife unit to be the, the way, uh, the, the, the key foundational relationship, and from that, uh, Children made in God's image are, are birthed, and, and that process is in place, uh, typing uh, God bringing children into his eternal family uh, as, as, uh, as the plan of God continues. But he says, likewise, uh, men burned in their lust one for another, men with men, committing what is shameful, committing what is shameful, and receiving in themselves the penalty of, of the error which was due. Uh, this, this second point is this, committing shameful acts can lead us toward more destructive behavior. It can lead us towards more shameful acts or, or, or destructive behavior that is not the, the outcome that God wants shame to have upon us as we live our lives. It's interesting that this committing these shameful acts, uh, he, he says here in verse 28 that even as they didn't retain God in their knowledge, referring to an earlier part of, the, of, the, of the, the chapter, God gave them over to this debased mind to do the things which aren't fitting. And then he, then he lays out this, the, these consequences, the, 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 be, the shameful acts that continue lead to more, and, and it spreads into all kinds of areas. And, and these itself are, are shameful acts that if not turned from, they lead towards more and more. Because look at verse, verse 32, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, the, these things are not right, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, if, if that's a, a, a way of practicing, Practice all of the kinds of things that we're going to read here in a second. Not only do they do the same, but they also approve of those who practice them, uh, which is a, a tragedy which we see going on. And here are those, those acts, filled with unrighteousness, filled with sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, giving, giving ourselves over to coveting something or, or a covetous way of life, maliciousness, being an envious person, being a murderous person, strife, are you a person that has, or we, or can we be people that give ourselves over to strife, or, or live by way of deceit, 
evil-mindedness, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, folks who are, are practicing an ongoing disobedience to parents. God says that is, that is a shameful act to continually disobey parents. It is, uh, as children, we made missteps. Our, our, our parents correct us of that. But if we are in the situation as children, we have many children in this congregation, how, how will you answer that question? Are you obedient to your parents? Do you look to your parents and recognize that part of my obedience to God is in being obedient to my parents? I know my parents aren't perfect. I know they, they are a sheep under the true shepherd like I am a sheep under the two, true shepherd. But I must strive to obey them lest I, I move into this, this thing of continually disobeying my parents because that, that is shameful. And it leads to more, more kinds of things that uh, are, are, are considered by God to be more destructive behavior. Undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Through our shameful behavior, it can also lead to more destructive behavior when we hold on to that guilt. Uh, that, that's something that uh, talked with brethren over the years who have struggled, and that can destroy a person spiritually. Why, why does that? Why does that destroy us, or why can that destroy us spiritually when we hold on to the guilt, when we hold on to the shameful act, and, and not let it go? Uh, I submit to you that the main reason is because that is the nature of Satan. He is all about accusing us. He is all about standing before God and accusing each of us on and on and on again. Uh, and, and, and that is just the opposite of Christ. We've talked about this many times. Christ is there as our advocate and Satan is there as our accuser. When we are, when we are holding on to guilt and holding on to the shame instead of uh, recognizing the shame and, and turning, we, we in a sense are, are following the father of this world, of Satan the devil. That is, that is his MO. That's how he operates. Satan does not let it go. And when we do not let it go, uh, that, that traps us. It traps us and, and it is a mind that is not of God. Uh, a person holding on to one's guilt sometimes hides instead of confesses. Uh, there, is, there is something that is very, very a, 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 a process in place that, that God talks about, this confessing of the sin that, that relieves us from the shame of, of, of hiding something, that, that relieves us from the shame as we turn to go toward God. Otherwise, that, that shame can continue and it can lead to more destructive behavior. The fear of being found out by another individual stifles us, preventing the person uh, from being clear to the sin. When we hide a sin and we continue in that sin, and we continue to carry that shame and that guilt of that sin as we, can, as we strive to, to uh, perpetuate our image. Or we can become so strangled by a sin that it overwhelms us or we just simply refuse to allow God to forgive us. All of those kinds of things are where shame leads to more and more destructive behavior. Another area of, of how that happens is this. I heard this recently just in a, in a, uh, on a local radio station as they were, they were talking about what is the worst mistake you have ever made in your marriage? Uh, and that was very telling, uh, the, the, the statements that were made. But I was intrigued by this one uh, statement that a woman made. She called in and she said, my first marriage was a very bad marriage. I was married to a very bad person. He was, he was abusive in his uh, physical uh, behavior towards the children. He was not a good husband. He was just a, a mean-spirited individual that created incredible problems for, for my children. I felt very, even though I got out of that marriage eventually, I felt shame over not protecting my children to the degree that I should have with uh, from, from my husband and from his behavior. You know, she's thinking about at the time, you know, trying to, you know, he's got a role as father and, and, and just how you, how you do all of that. It, it just got, it got weird and it got worse and it got worse. So she left, uh, she left that situation feeling shame. 
So, but, but what she did in the process of that shame, of feeling that shame, because of that shame and that guilt over that, it was in a sense a, an overcompensation or a boomerang guilt. So therefore she drew the conclusion uh, as she met another man in her life. And in this case, this man was an honorable man, a, a, a man who was just, a man whom she could trust, a man who in, in so many ways modeled the kind of husband and father that her first husband should have been. But because she felt so responsible and so shamed for the behavior that her husband had, her first husband had done towards the children and, and that she felt responsible, she didn't allow her new husband to really have any impact at all on the children. She, she overcompensated to where it's all on me. It's all on me to do this. So here was a man in, this, in these people's lives that could, could have made a very, very positive impact on her children, and she shut them out. And she said, that was the worst mistake I could have ever made. Now, I, I say as a caveat, uh, those that are in that situation know that especially when you have blended families coming in, it, it's, it's critical for the, the blood parent to take the lead in the parenting of that, of that child, at least initially. Even, even in a situation where you've got a second marriage and, and the husband comes in, uh, if the mom is the blood parent of the children, it's critical for her to continue in that role uh, in, a, in the process of, of that relationship being built and that process of comfort being in the home and the children trusting this, this man that's now in their lives, and, and that role that that new father plays will, will increase over time uh, uh, throughout that marriage uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a good, healthy way. But, so I, I say that as a caveat, but she shut that out and she realized later the impact that that had on the development of her children. It, it was a negative aspect where it could have been a very positive thing. But, so what I'm saying is, is shame can, can result in overcompensation and going a, a different way versus being driven by an overridden, overriding sense of guilt. That, that's, what, that's how she made that decision versus being driven by doing what is right. That's what I'm saying. Uh, we can be driven by an overriding sense of guilt versus being driven by doing what is right. Uh, so that, that is a critical piece in terms of the, the subject of shame and how to deal with that. Okay, the third point uh, that ties a little bit uh, to some degree with the sermonette. Let's go to Jeremiah 3. A, a third aspect of shame that is, is critical for, for us as God's people. It's, it's critical in the history of of, of Israel. It, it's, it's critical in as we see uh, our nation and, and the way that our nation continues to move farther and farther away from, from anything of, of godly biblical value. Not saying that it's gone, but we see, we see that, we, we, we see it continuing, and we know that it's going to worsen. Jeremiah 3, verse 1. Jeremiah 3, verse 1. They say if a man divorces his wife and she goes from him and becomes another man's, may he return to her again? Would not that land be greatly polluted? But he says to, to Israel, he says to uh, the southern kingdom there, but, but you have played the harlot with many lovers. I guess, you know, in some way speaking of spiritual idolatry, uh, some way also speaking of the adultery that was in the land, spiritual idolatry, spiritual adultery. You have polluted, uh, the you have played the harlot with many lovers, yet return to me, says the Lord. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see, where, where have you not lain with, with men? By the road you have sat there like an Arabian in the wilderness, and, and you've polluted the land with your harlotries and your wickedness. Therefore, the showers have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead, he says here. You refuse to be ashamed. And that is the third point. We can... Uh, get to that dull of hearing state that Mr. Bennett was talking about that, that played all the way out, uh, we can move to a point where we cannot even experience shame 
It's a, a tragic situation, but I've, I've seen that uh, at times with those who attended with us to where they can, can no longer even experience shame. They become so, uh, allowed themselves to become so brazen in, in the sin uh, that the sin begins to sear the conscience to where shameful acts no longer become shameful. Uh, Jeremiah 6. Let's look at Jeremiah 6. Jeremiah 6 speaks to this in verse 10. He says, To whom shall I speak? To whom shall I give warning uh, that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised. Another uh, tie in to, to Mr. Bennett's message. Uh, the, their ear is uncircumcised. Uh, they, they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is a reproach to them. They don't have delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I'm weary of holding it in. I'll pour it out on the children outside and on the assembly of young men together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who's, who's full of days, and their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together. I'm going to stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Eternal, because from the least of them, even to the greatest men of them, everyone is given to covetousness. It's not like, oh, I, I coveted this. Oh, I shouldn't have done it. God, forgive me. I'm ashamed of that sin. Turn, help me turn. No, they're, they're given to it, given over to something that it is a way of life for them. And from the prophet, even, even down to the priest, everyone deals falsely. They've healed the, the hurt of my people in a superficial way, saying, peace, peace, when, when there's no peace. Were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed, nor did they know how to blush. We've read that many times, but think about that with respect to shame. No, they weren't ashamed. They didn't even know how to blush. You know that feeling when you, you blew it and it's there and people see it and it just, it just takes over the face. I hate that feeling. And I felt it way too many times. But it, the, the shame of that, it, but to get to the point where we no longer even blush at a sin, it can happen. It can happen to God's people. Therefore, he says, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time I punish them, punish them they shall be cast down, said the Lord. Well, I mean, we, we look at a, a phrase like that and we look at this and we think, well, wait a second, I, I, I'm not an idolater. I'm not caught up in spiritual idolatry. I'm not caught up in adultery. I'm not looking to commit adultery with my eyes or with my, my mind or, or with my body. I'm not doing that. Well, this doesn't apply to me. Well, let's ask ourselves this. What are the things that each of us allows to come out of our mouths? The things that we think. The things that we say. What, what, what things do we allow to come out of our mouths in the presence of our family, in the presence of God's people? Uh, teachings of the church, issues uh, of doctrine in the church that the church has covered. Maybe a, a, a doctrinal uh, position that maybe we don't necessarily agree with wholeheartedly. Uh, the, the things that you see posted in Facebook, the things that we can talk about amongst ourselves on things where there are differences there, uh, a critical spirit, what I write to others, what I, what I allow myself to say to others, and the, the caustic nature with which I can say it. I, I would ask, do we or have we at times allowed ourselves to get into that state to, we, to where we no longer even feel shame for the way that we handle a situation, to where it doesn't even cause us to blush. That's one thing. That's one, uh, that's one area. How free are we with that? How quick are we to, to go down that path? And is it so easy? <laughs> is it so easy because of everything that we've gone through as a people and the doctrinal struggles and the challenges that we've faced, the bad behavior that we've witnessed, uh, that, that we can just allow ourselves to go down that road freely and see ourselves completely justified in doing it to where we don't even blush or don't even recognize anymore what, what we're doing. Again, that, that's just one example. Uh, and and as, I, as I think of that, as I think of the other areas uh, uh, of where we can trip up as God's people, it's very critical for us to, to analyze why we say what we say, what we think, what we do, 
to, to recognize, is there anything in my life that I've allowed myself to move into that area? We can do it. We can do it. It's destructive to the church. It's destructive to us uh, when, when, we, when we allow that in and, and don't deal with it appropriately. Jeremiah 7 talks more about uh, that, uh, the, the whole thing of, of shame and, and, and blushing. But let's go to our fourth and final point today. This whole area of, of shame and guilt can have a very positive influence. Shame and guilt should serve as the catalyst. It should serve as the catalyst for repentance and substantive growth. It hits us and it hits us hard and we blush and we realize, man, I blew this. I blew this. I blew this by not doing what I should have done, by, by, uh, by inaction. I blew this by action. I blew this by what I said. Uh, but it, it can serve as a catalyst for repentance and substantive growth, just as much as shame and blame can take us down another path, as uh, the other paths, as we already mentioned. Psalm 51, 14, we won't turn there, but, you know, David's psalm, deliver me from the guilt of bloodshed. Deliver me from the guilt, the shame of bloodshed. He, he committed bloodshed. We have committed bloodshed as we have, have been the reason for Christ's death, by, for the reason for his shedding his blood. Deliver me from that, O God, the God of my salvation, and I'll carry that shame for eternity. No, he says, and my tongue shall sing aloud of your righteousness. The God, the God of, of, of great love and mercy cleaning us and cleansing us and making us white. Let's contrast uh, two godly men with another godly man in the time remaining. Let's go to Ezra 9. As we think about uh, shame and guilt serving as a catalyst for repentance and substantive growth. And from that then the shame is removed. Ezra 9 we won't spend much time on the second one, but I want to I turn to Ezra because this comes back to deal with the situation that we discussed earlier with Abigail. I wanna, it's kind of a sub-point, but I want to I talk about that because it, it brings us to our conclusion. Uh, Ezra 9, verse 1. So here, you know, set the stage here. We've got uh, is, uh, you know, Israel went into captivity. Judah, uh, the southern kingdom, went into captivity. They were finally able to come back under the Persian Empire and begin to, to uh, uh, worship God. Uh, the, the king of Persia allowed that to happen, and, and here they are, and Ezra is a key part in that. Verse 1 of chapter 9. When these things were done, the, the leaders came to me, Ezra says here, uh, saying, you know, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the land with respect to the abominations of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, uh, all the different ones. He says, for, for the, these, are, these are the priests here. He says, uh, you know, the, the, the people of Israel and the priests and the Levites, uh, so all, all of them here. He says, for, for they have taken some of the daughters as wives for themselves and their sons, so that the holy seed is mixed with the people of those lands. Indeed, the hand of the leaders and rulers has been foremost in this trespass. So, it, you know, it's a direct contradiction to Leviticus 21, 14, if you've got that in your margin, but that's uh, of, of where he's saying, you know, to the priests, do you must marry uh, of your own. You can't go outside of the children of Israel to marry. Do not do that. That is, that is a, a major, major sin. That is a major do not do. And yet they did that. Now, now think about Ezra as, as he is recognizing this, what his response would have been. What, what should it have been? Uh, think about what Abigail did. Verse 3, so Ezra said, when I heard, uh, when I tore my garment, uh, when I heard this thing, I tore my garment and my robe and, and plucked out some of the hair of my head and beard and sat down astonished. Now, I have had hair plucked out by accident at different times, and it's not, it's, it's, it's not, it's not pleasant. Uh, and incidentally, I heard of a, of a recent situation of hair being plucked out with a, with a mixer uh, by accident. You know, kind of get, ooh, not good. But anyway, this is a situation where he did it. He was so, so just exasperated by this. He, he's grabbing the hair of his head. And he pulls, he plucks out his hair. He said, I sat down astonished. I was astonished by this. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the, of, of the God of Israel. Now think about that. Everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel. 
do we tremble at the words of the God of Israel as, as we reflect upon what goes on around us? Everyone who did this assembled to me because of the transgression of those who had been carried away captive. And he said, I, I just sat astonished until the evening sacrifice. At the evening sacrifice, I arose from my fasting. Having torn my garment and my robe, I fell on my knees and, and spread out my hands to the Lord my God and said, Oh my God, I am too ashamed and humiliated to lift my face to you, O oh God, my God, for our iniquities have risen higher than our heads and our guilt has grown up to the heavens. Since the days of our fathers to this day, we have been very guilty. And for our iniquities, we, our, our kings and our priests, have been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands, to the sword, to captivity, to plunder, and to humiliation as it is this day. And now for a little while, grace has been shown to us, uh, from the Lord our God. He, you, you've done this for us. You've left a remnant to escape and, 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 and to give us a peg in his holy place that our God may enlighten our eyes and give us a measure of revival in our bondage. We were slaves, yet our God didn't forsake us in our bondage. He extended mercy to us in the sight of the kings of Persia uh, to revive us, to repair the house of God, to rebuild its ruin, and to give us a wall in Judah and Jerusalem. And now, O oh God, what should we say after this? For we've forsaken your commandments. So he's, he's reflecting on this, and he's, he's saying that he is part of this. These commandments that you've commanded your servants, the prophets, saying, the land which you're entering this possess, to possess is an unclean land with the uncleanness of the peoples of the lands, with their abominations, which have filled it from one end to the other with impurity. Now, therefore, don't give your wives, uh, your daughters as wives for their sons and take their daughters to your sons. Don't do this and never seek their peace or prosperity that you may be strong and eat the good of the land and, and, and leave it as an inheritance to your children forever. And he says, and after all that has come on us for our evil deeds and for our great guilt, since you, our God, have punished us less than our iniquities deserve, and you've given us such deliverance of this, are we going to do this again? Should we again break your commandments and join in marriage with the people committing these abominations? Would you not be angry with us until you had consumed us entirely so that there would be no remnant of Israel? Oh God, you are righteous. You are righteous, for we are left as a remnant as it is this day. And here we are before you in our guilt, though no one can stand before you because of this. I, I, just, I find that fascinating fascinating that, that here, here Ezra, in a sense, is doing, he, he's, take, he's taking on, just like Abigail did, the sins of the people because he sees himself as a fellow human being, a fellow, uh, in, in, in the fellow, uh, a fellow plight of, of, of the humanity that man faces, the, the humanity of these few, peop, that these people were facing, the, the decisions that they had made that were poor. And, and he, he accepted that burden upon himself as well, uh, possibly for not noting this sooner, for not recognizing this sooner, for not being so attuned to God's way of life that, that it, it had to be waited until this was, was told to him. Well, whatever it was, he accepted his responsibility in that just as Abigail did. Think about Daniel, what Daniel did. Daniel, in his prayers to God, he said, to us belong shame of face for what we've done. Daniel was a human being. Daniel was a godly man, but Daniel also recognized the sins of the people, and he recognized his part in that by extension. Is it any different than, than those of us who are parents, who, who deal with an act that our, our, our child does, that we just, oh, why did he do that? Why did she do that? And, and as parents, we feel the shame of that act. As a husband, we feel the shame of of, 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 of maybe something that our wife did that was inappropriate, or vice versa, or, or as a sibling. I, I've had siblings, uh, I've had people come to me sometimes who apologize for their, and feel shame for their sibling's behavior. I, that, that's, that's, part, that's part of what's going on there, that, that collection of the church. I, as a pastor, I, 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 I confess to you, I, when, when, when there are things that are going on, that, that somebody commits that's inappropriate, I feel shame for that. I feel shame for that because I, God has entrusted me with, with caring for you. I, I feel that shame. I feel that shame when a, a kid acts up at camp that's from our congregation. I feel that shame when a kid from, from camp from anywhere in the United States that comes to Camp Carter. 
uh, misbehaves. I, I feel that shame because I've got a role in that. I feel that shame with, with, with any act of, of any camper out in any of, the, any of the camps because I'm part of the camp team. But, but it, is, it, is, it is part of, of a process that God has put in place for us in our humanity uh, of, of how we are connected and, and the way that that impacts all of us. That is the nature of it, and that is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a bad thing because we, we are our brother's keeper. Just as, as the high priest, let's go to Hebrews. Let's go to Hebrews as we, as we wrap this up. Uh, Hebrews 12, just as the high priest on the Day of Atonement offered a sacrifice for his sins before offering another sacrifice for the sins of his people, uh, sins of the people. Uh, that, that, is, that is part of that, that connection that we have as, as humanity. That's a part of the connection that we have as the body of Christ. But it's a little bit different with Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Hebrews 12, verse 1 Hebrews 12, verse 1, we know this, this, this phrase of, uh, of as, it, as it moves from Hebrews 11 to Hebrews 12, the faith chapter. Since we're surrounded by this, this great cloud of witnesses referring to the individuals of faith in Hebrews 11, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which easily ensnares us, and let us run that race with endurance that is set before us. We look to Jesus, Jesus Christ, who is the originator and the perfecter, the, the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was before, set before him endured the cross. Jesus Christ despised the shame. He despised it. He hated the shame. He hated the shame that he endured and now has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Why did Daniel readily accept that shame and, and take that on uh, and not necessarily despise it? Uh, why did Ezra take that on? Why did Abigail take that on? And what is, in, in what way was that different from Jesus Christ? In Jesus Christ's situation, Jesus Christ had no part, no part in any way in deserving any shame. Never. He's never done anything that was de deserving of shame. He never had an inappropriate thought, an inappropriate way of handling a situation with another individual, another, any, any situation of not adequately looking after those under his care. He was perfect in every way. So for him to take that on, he took it on humbly, but he despised it. He despised it because nothing that he has ever done, nothing that he has ever thought has been worthy of shame. Nothing is shameful. That's why he, he despised it. Yet he took that on uh, as he became sin for us. Shame is an outgrowth of sin. Christ had no sin. Adam and Eve were naked and not ashamed. When they sinned, they felt shame over their nakedness. That was an outgrowth of the sin. But Christ took it on. He took on the, the sins of mankind becoming sin for our salvation. Two final passages as we think, as we go forward. What are we to do with shame? What are we to do with shame? Jeremiah 3 verse 21. Jeremiah 3, back to the passage in Jeremiah 3, talking about what, what he wanted for them then, but what applies to us as God's people now, those that, are, uh, that have spiritually circumcised ears, and I pray we all do. Jeremiah 3, verse 21. Jeremiah 3, verse 21, he states, A voice was heard on the desolate heights, weeping and supplications of the children of Israel. For they've perverted their way, they've forgotten the Lord their God. He says to them, Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Hopefully, we as God's people are not backsliding. We are continuing to go forward, recognizing uh, the impact of our sin, turning from it when shame hits us for that sin, and walking fully in God's ways. Indeed, we do come to you, for you are the Lord our God. Truly in vain is salvation hope for, for from the hills, from the mountain to, mountains and multitude of mountains. Truly in the Lord our God is the salvation of Israel, for shame has devoured the labor of our fathers from our youth, their flocks and their herds, their sons and their daughters. We lie down in our shame. And, we, and our reproach covers us, for we've sinned against the Lord our God. We and our fathers, for from our youth, even to this day, we have not obeyed the voice of the Lord God. 1 through 2, if you return, O Israel, says the Lord, return to me, 
Turn, return to me, and if you will put away your abominations out of my sight, then you shall not be moved. You shall swear the Lord lives in truth, in judgment, in righteousness. The nations shall bless themselves in him, and they shall see glory, the opposite of shame. Finally, Joel, 20, uh, Joel 2. Joel 2, as we move forward to the fall holy days and we think about the return of Christ, we think about Jesus Christ setting up his throne in Jerusalem, we think about David ruling over the, the 12 tribes, we think about the apostles uh, being individually over the, the 12 tribes as spirit beings serving God, as we think about our role serving God as kings and priests and, and working with, with people, mankind, as, as they're beginning to, to walk God's way and turn from the shame uh, what a beautiful time it will be. Let's turn finally to Joel 2, verse 26. Joel 2, verse 26. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you. And my people shall never be put to shame. And you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame.